welcome everyone to our Sunday evening worship service. We appreciate you being here today. I hope you had a wonderful afternoon and a beautiful day. We had a wonderful service this morning. We appreciate the good attendance that we've, we've had. So if you're visiting with us, you're, we want to welcome you. I tell you, we really appreciate you meeting to worship with us. Welcome you anytime. In our service tonight, Brother Jeremy Jones will be leading our singing. Brother Chris Beard will be saying our opening prayer. Brother Ethan Kendrick will be reading our scripture. A lesson by Brother Greg Pollock. Announcements from Billy, Brother Billy Martin and the closing prayer from Brother Wayne Taylor. Let's join in our singing as Brother Jones comes to lead us. First song tonight will be 10,000 Reasons. Would you stand with me as we sing this? Sing out. My soul, my soul, my soul.
you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, as we approach your throne this evening, Father, we thank you for this wonderful day we've had today. Father, we are thankful that we've been able to gather together to worship you, Father, without fear of being hindered in any way. Father, we pray for all of those who are having difficulties in life, those who are having medical troubles. Father, be with them, be with the doctors, help them get back to their most wanted places in life. Also, Father, we pray for the Parker family as they are right now getting ready to welcome them, their newest member. Father, we ask you that you will be with them and be with the doctors and help it be a, a joyous time. Father, we pray that you will be with each and every one of us as we go through our daily walks. Father, we pray that we will let others see you living in us and that we be a light shining to the world. We ask you that you go with us, guide us, and keep us near thee. In Christ's name, amen. Song of Invitation is number 943, Do You Know My Jesus, number 943. Next song will be number 570, A Beautiful Life. 570. Each day I'll do, each day I'll do, I'll do my love and be, my love and be, my love and be.
be read from the book of Job, chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Job, chapter 22, verse 1 through 5. I'll be reading for the, with the English Standard Version. Then Eliphaz, then Eliphaz answered and said, Can a man be profitable to God? Surely who is wise is profitable to himself. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty if you are in the right, or is it Gain to him if you make your ways blameless. Is it for your fear of him that he reproves you and enters in judgment with you? It's not your evil abundant. There is no end to your iniquities. Good evening. Appreciate you being here tonight as always and hope that uh, your day has been a good one. And I uh, hope that tonight as we study together, it will end in a great way as well. We're going to continue our journey through uh, Job tonight and, and try to click off a few more chapters. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open there to Job chapter 22. That's where we're going to start. And, and kind of like we've done in the past, uh, we're not going to look at all of these verses. 
Uh, what I want to do tonight is glean some principles from these various chapters. And if there's something that stands out about this particular section in the book of Job, and by the way, in Job 22 is kind of the third cycle of speeches, okay? That's when some more speeches come and Job answers. But if there's something that, that kind of brings these all together, I think it's the resolve of Job here. Uh, you remember that Job has lost basically everything that he has, including his health. And that his friends, rather than helping him, have actually made things worse. Now at the beginning, they were very helpful. They sat with him, didn't say anything. But since that time, they've basically been accusing Job and saying, you deserve this, all of these things are coming because you did something to deserve it. And so there continues to be this back and forth. And, and tonight we're going to look at these uh, few chapters together. Uh, bring in some, a lot of other scripture from other places in the Bible and hopefully just gain some principles from this uh, without getting uh, too lost in the forest here in the book of Job uh, that will help us as we seek to live a Christian life. When we look at uh, Job 22, we see some attacks. In this particular chapter, Eliphaz is speaking again and he accuses Job of some very specific sins. Uh, if you look there at the text, and again, this is one of those deals where if you want to get the most out of these lessons, you're going to have to look at the text and, and, and read it for yourself. We're not going to have time to do all of that. But I do want to highlight some of the verses. Uh, verse 5 here is, Not your evil abundant, there is no end to your wickedness. In verses 6 through 9, he talks about how Job has mistreated his fellow man. Uh, exacted pledges of your brothers for nothing, stripped the naked of their clothing, given no water to the weary for drink. You've withheld bread from the hungry. And it goes on and on and on. And then he gets down to verses 10 and 11 and says, Look, look, you're getting what you deserve. This is what you had coming. So once again, Eliphaz is on the attack. I want us to look at the other part of that and think about what Job did and did not do in the midst of all of this, just not this chapter. When we are attacked, and we are, when we are attacked unjustly, when we are attacked with people that accuse us of things that we did not do, how do we respond? Well, first of all, do not return evil for evil. You know, it's tempting to lash out at those around us. It's tempting to get even. It's tempting to misrepresent and falsely accuse them in return. It's tempting to get in the mud hole with them and both get dirty. But Jesus calls us to be different. Matthew 5, 11 and 12, he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Job had some things to say to his friends. He had some things to say to God, but he did not return evil for evil. Secondly, continue to live righteously. Some will say, well, you know, they're accusing me of doing this, so I'm just going to do it. They're accusing me of all of these things, so I'm just going to fulfill their prophecies. Instead, we need to continue to live righteously. We need to keep doing what is right. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 12, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds... And glorify God on the day of visitation. And then thirdly, there's the times when we need to make the truth known. To maintain our influence, it may be necessary to defend our integrity. Now Job is going to do this, more so in chapter 31, defending himself against these accusations. There were times uh, in Paul's life when he kind of let things go. But there were other times that he made the truth known and defended himself against those who distorted his teaching. But I guess more than anything, it is trust the righteous judge. The most important th uh, being to whom we must give an account is God. See, what he thinks is what really matters. Job is going to say in chapter 31, 6, Let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy, destroy both soul and body in hell. We have the example of Jesus, as Peter talks about in 1 Peter 2, 23. 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself to the one that judges justly. Now these next few points, if you're following along there on your outline, these are points of advice from Eliphaz. Okay? These are points that he is telling Job, things he's telling Job to do. Now we know in this particular occasion that these did not necessarily fit Job's situation since they thought he had created some great sin, committed some great sin, and his, his, uh, uh, that, that, that he had done all this to deserve it. Having said that, though, the comments that Eliphaz made were good in general and beneficial in helping us develop our relationship with God. So although perhaps Eliphaz was off base in accusing Job the way that he did, the advice that he gave was good advice. And so here are some of the things that he says. Verse 21, he says, yield to God. Agree with God and be at peace. Therefore, good will come to you. Yield to God. Agree with God. Allow God to rule things in your life. We've got to yield our desires to God. Agree with the way God wants us to live our lives. Allowing ourselves to become what God wants us to be. The only way to reach our full potential. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We do the works that God has created for us. Verse 22, Receive God's instructions. Receive instruction from His mouth and lay up His words in your heart. You know, good teachers still have to have students who are willing to learn. As students of God, we have to be willing to listen to His instruction, to try to understand and obey His instructions. Several, thing, several times during the Gospel accounts, Matthew eleven fifteen, 15, Matthew 13, 9, Matthew 13, 43, other places, Jesus says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then, when we hear those instructions, we translate them into action. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And then in verse 23, Job is told to remove unrighteousness from the home. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. If you remove injustice far from your tents. Eliphaz seemed to think that Job had to return stolen goods to its rightful owners. In this way, he would prove to everyone he loved God more than money. Money. Of course, we know Eliphaz was wrong here, but we've got to ask ourselves, are there things in our lives that we need to return, conflict with the Christian lifestyle, things that we need to change in order to get right before God? In chapter 22, Job spe uh, Eliphaz speaks and basically says that Job is wicked. In chapter 23 is when we get Job's response. In this chapter we call, talk about when coming before God. Job wanted to present his case before God. He knew that God was holy and just. He believed that uh, if he could have an audience with God, he would be acquitted. Uh, circumstances would be reversed. So here are some things to remember, some things that we learned from this chapter about coming before God. First of all, it's to have that desire to come before God. Verse, verse 3, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Verse 4, that I would lay my case before him. He says, I want to come before God. I want to approach God. You know, it's commendable here that Job was a worshiper of God in both good times and bad. Have you found people that are one or the other? Are we guilty sometimes of being one or the other? Now, for some folks, it's when things get bad. When things get bad... They become godly real quickly. They, they, they talk about God. They worship God. It's all about God. And then when things are good, not so much. But then there's the other group of folks that's just opposite. For them, it's when things are going well that they're all about worshiping God. But should something come their way that is less than good, well, then they're, really, they're ready to chunk God out the window. Job had a desire to come before God, to worship God, in good times and in bad. 
we can approach God because of Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. John says in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And then in coming to God, we see Job, verse 4, speak honestly with God. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Job wanted to persuasively speak to God concerning his innocence. It's amazing and wonderful that we have a God that listens, that allows us to come before Him, that allows us to speak honestly with Him, that allows us to ask those questions, that allows us to say, God, I don't know what to ask. I don't know what it is that I need to pray. Of course, we've got to remember that in doing this, we do so with great reverence, that God is still God and we are still not. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Come before God. Speak honestly with Him. But then verse 5, be willing to listen to God. Job said, I would know what He would answer me and understand what He would say to me. Now it gets a little more difficult, right? It's one thing to cry out to God. It's one thing to ask God questions. But what happens? What happens when we don't like the answers? What happens when what God is saying that we need to do doesn't coincide with what we really want to do? You see, coming before God also entails listening to Him, willing to listen and do what He tells us to do. Verse 6, believe that God is concerned about us. Job says, would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me. Job is confident in the fact that God would pay attention to him. Now, we've, we've noted before that as you go through these chapters, there's, a, there's an up and down and a roller coaster of emotions and beliefs and feelings that Job is going through. There are times that he's crying out to God with the sense of, I don't know if he'll listen to me. But in this particular chapter, he says, I know that God's concerned about me. I know that he'll pay attention to me. We have to remember the same thing. God does care about us. God loves us. And even in the midst of those terrible trials, even in the midst of, of troublesome times, God is still there. God still cares. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because... He cares for you. In a world in which a lot of people cannot find many people to list who actually care about them, we have a God that cares for us. Next, trust that God can help us. Verse 7, There an upright man could argue with him, and I would be acquitted forever by my judge. Job believed that he would be acquitted by God. He believed that God was fair, that God was just, that God was honest, and that he would help him, that he would acquit him. The Hebrew writer says in chapter 4, verse 16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find help in the time of need. God may not always give us what we want but he will give us what we need. And we can take confidence in that. With chapter 24, we get some characteristics of evildoers. Characteristics of evildoers. This, again, is Job still talking. And he talks about uh, the wicked. And his question is, where is God in all of this? If I'm suffering the way that I'm suffering, and I look around and I see all these wicked people... Why are they not suffering more than I am? And again, these are blocks of scriptures. We won't look at them in detail. But he notes some characteristics of these evildoers. And that's what I want you to understand uh, before we move on. He says in verses 2 through 12 that they prey on the weak. That's what evildoers do. They deceptively moved boundaries to enlarge their own boundaries. They mistreated widows and orphans. 
They stole neighbors' flocks. They took, a, they took away the children who had no fathers and likely made them slaves. Evil existed and was active. And Job acknowledged this. He says in verses 13 through 17 that they hide under the cloak of darkness. The, the uh, light and darkness motif is throughout Scripture, and evil is often associated with darkness. If you look at passages such as Ephesians 5, 8 through 14, Paul there talks about the light in the darkness and how that you were in the darkness and in the light and how that evil is associated with that darkness. But Job acknowledges in the last part of the chapter that they are destined for destruction. Notice especially verses 18 through 25 that God is going to bring the wicked to judgment and that they will in fact be punished. We like Job can look around and see a lot of evil in the world. And we may look and say, why do the evil prosper? Why is it that the wicked seem to have it better than I do? The fact of the matter is, they do prey on the weak. They do often hide under the cloak of darkness. But remember also that God says, I'm going to take care of that in my time. I'm still in control, and I will deal with the wicked when I decide to deal with the wicked. Chapter 25 is when we get to Bildad. And if you are a person that is reading through the book of Job, when you get to chapter 25, you, you breathe a sigh of relief. Why is that? It's only six verses, okay? In some of these chapters that seem to go on and on forever, we have a very short chapter here of six verses. And Bildad basically says, God is so great, man is so bad, man cannot stand righteous before God. And so when we look at this chapter, we ask the question, how can a man be righteous before God? And just want to remind you of some principles I think you already know. In the first five verses here, Bildad portrays the awesome nature of God. He talks about the dominion and fear, and, and is there any number to his armies, and upon whom does his light not arise? How great and wonderful God is, a wonderful description of God. But then in verse 6, he contrasts man and says, How much less man who is a maggot, and the son of man who is a worm. So how can, how can man be righteous before God? First of all, we need to remember that man is the crown of God's creation. Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the livestock, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You see, we didn't evolve from some lower life form as evolution maintains today. We were created by an all-powerful and a wise God who loves us. That great God that Bildad describes in the first five verses is the one that created us in His image. And He made us not only physical but also spiritual. And He gave us the capacity to learn and to grow, to think and to feel, to experience all sorts of emotions. Psalm 8, 4, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Man is the crown of God's creation. But you see, sin has devalued man. Psalm 22, 6, the psalmist says, I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. If you go over to the, uh, the New Testament and you look at the book of Romans, verses 10 through 18, Paul there gives a vivid description of man apart from God and the fact that no one is righteous in God's eyes. Sin has devalued that creation. But the third thing is, man can be made righteous through the sacrifice of Christ. You see, if you continue to read on in Romans chapter 3, in verses 21 through 26, Paul spells this out for us. And says that, that while without Christ we have no hope, there is no righteousness that through Christ we can stand before God as righteous. So how can a man stand righteous before God? Through and only through Jesus Christ. Paul realized this in Romans 7 when he said, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who you know sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How can man be righteous before God? Only through Christ. Chapter 26. Job is talking again, and in this particular chapter... Job has a lot of wonderful things to say about the Almighty God. Job relates the greatness of God, and particularly the greatness of His creation in this chapter. He talks about the powerfulness of God, the majesty of God, the control of God. And in that, he highlights that God is the ruler of everything. Specifically, he talks here about places. In verses 5 and 6, he has complete control over Sheol. Verses 7 through 10, dominion over the highest heavens. 11, authority over the mountains. 12 and 13, power over the sea. And it goes on and on and on and on. Not spelled out as clearly in this chapter, but I think applicable as well, is the fact that God's majesty is not over places, but also over people. This is spelled out different places in Scripture. Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Luke 12, 7. Why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more value than sparrows. God is ruler of everything. God is ruler of his people, the church. 2 Timothy 2, 19. God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Matthew 6, 8. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. God knows. God knows us. He knows what we need before we ask. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. God is ruler of all people. God has knowledge of all people. Understanding that the world's population now is several billion. Yet Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient, not wanting any to perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is going to judge everyone. The billions that have gone before and the billions that may come after. He is ruler of all people. He is the ruler of the living and the dead. Jesus said in John 5, 28, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice. And they'll come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. What are we saying? We're saying that God is an awesome God. That God is in control and ruler over everything, all places, all people. Paul said it this way in Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments, and how inscrutable His ways. And so we get to chapter 27, the final chapter we'll talk about tonight. In this particular chapter, I think it sums up what has been going on throughout, and that is Job's integrity. If you look at the first couple of verses here of this chapter, I'm going to see that Job believed that God had caused this suffering. Now, again, he was not privy to the information that we have from the beginning of the book and know who is ultimately responsible, but he believes that God is responsible for this. But here's the deal. In all of this, even though he believed this, he maintained his integrity. He maintained his integrity. He kept living the way that he thought he should live, and he maintained his innocence. Not that he had never sinned, but that he had not sinned so greatly to deserve what had come upon him. 
And so in doing this, in this particular chapter, he made some resolutions, if you will, some things that illustrate his integrity and some lessons that we can learn as well. First of all, in verses 3 and 4, he resolved not to lie. He says, my lips, verse 4, my lips will not speak falsehood and my tongue will not utter deceit. In, in context here, what he's saying is, I'm not going to admit to a sin that I've not committed. He would not allow his circumstances to distort his integrity. Think about that. Isn't it easy to allow the situations around us to determine who we are at that particular time? Someone has said integrity is what it is when you're that way no matter who's around. And that's who Job was. We've got to be truth bearers. Resolve not to lie. The example is given of Jesus in 1 Peter 2, 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Second, in verse 5, Job resolved not to give in to peer pressure. Far be it from me to say you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. Now understand that for a long time, these friends have been taking turns, taking pot shots at, at Job. When one would get finished and Job would answer, another one was ready to go. Both barrels loaded. Trying to get Job to renounce his integrity. But he refused to let his friends talk him into something that was untrue or doing something that was wrong. See, we talk about peer pressure today. Peer pressure has been around for a long, long time. And Job had the integrity to say, I'm not going to let you pressure me into doing something that I know is not right. His friends tried everything, but he did not give in. He would not be swayed, and neither should we. Number three, Job resolved not to bring shame on himself. Verse six, I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Job says, I'm living a godly life. He didn't want anything or to do anything that might bring him regret and inward pain. We need to live in a way that does not bring shame on ourselves and on others. And then this last point kind of covers basically the rest of the chapter, and that is that Job resolved he would not receive the inheritance of the wicked. These last several verses are Job's description of the wicked and what they're going to inherit and what they're going to uh, have to endure. And Job says, I don't want to be a part of that. I know what's the most important, and I don't want to have that inheritance. In Mark 8, 36 and 37, Jesus says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Job says, My soul's not up for sale. I'm going to maintain my integrity. So what does all of this mean for us? Well, because of the cross, we have a different vantage point than Job. Realizing the suffering that Jesus endured. Realizing the suffering that the early Christians endured. Like Job, we may not understand why bad things happen. Why are young people and old people a lot taken by cancer? Why does the father have a sudden heart attack? Why does a precious child die in an accident? But even in tragedies, Christians need to be encouraged by God's love and concern. What Job is eventually going to learn is that through all this, God does care and God will take care of him. I remind you again of the passage from 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. I hope that you can glean some lessons from Job's life. More than anything, his resolve to continue to live faithfully no matter what. I hope tonight that you can say, I'm going to be like Job. I'm going to live faithfully no matter what. If you're here tonight and you've not done that, and we can help you rectify that in some way, we certainly want to do that. If you just need encouragement and prayers, we want to do that. 
If you're not yet a Christian, if you've not been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and begin that walk with God that He promises, then we certainly want to assist you with that as well. If we can help in any way, please come as we stand and as we sing. Have you a heart that's weary? appreciate you attending the evening services of the Boonville Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you back each and every opportunity you may have. We have a few announcements before we conclude our service tonight. I'll bring your attention to the back of the bulletin. The Golden Circle will have their monthly luncheon this Tuesday in the Annex at 1130. The Golden Circle this Tuesday at 1130 in the Annex. Also, uh, remember, Sunday will be Senior Sunday, and we'll be honoring our graduates, Mr. Max Mooney, Mr. Colin Overstreet, Ms. McKaylee Owens, and Ms. Annabeth Worley. Also, our, our blood drive will be next Monday, the 15th. There's sign-up sheets in the foyer for that, and also for Vacation Bible School. These are all the announcements we have at this time.
been here that was unable to be here this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper has been prepared. You may pass it this time. Uh, it's in the little chapel, which is in the foyer and to your left. Final psalm before our closing prayer is Christ, we do all adore thee. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and its many blessings and for this opportunity and privilege we have to assemble together to worship you. And we pray, Father, that you will be with us now as we dismiss to go our respective ways. Guide, guard, and direct us until we return again in the next hour. And forgive us of our sins, Father, as we repent.